This is Tuesday, the 26th of March, 1991. The title of this tape will be something like The Poem of Era, although it may extend a little bit beyond my commentary on The Poem of Era. A few days ago, Ross Marshall brought a text of The Poem of Era that he had been studying. It has introductory material and also has a translation of the text, and the text is obviously has many lacunae in it, and many gaps in it, but it's, uh, there's enough there for the scholars to piece together the dramatis personae of the poem and the main action of the poem, the main theme of the poem. Suffice it to say that the poem of Era is a, a real corroborative contribution to Genesis 10 study, as I've dealt with it in the past, because it fills a gap, a major chronological gap, uh, of the Marduk epic as I interpret the Marduk epic. In other words, the poem of Era is a complement to the Marduk epic, and in terms of the amount of material that it covers, or the theme that it covers, it's comparable in importance to the Marduk epic, simply because it covers a strip of time located in uh, the Marduk epic, that, that is, a strip of time from early post diluvian history overlooked by the Marduk epic. My view is that the Marduk epic has two radically different sections to it even though the poet attempts to synthesize these two sections as though it were just one continuous action. There are two radically different parts. The first 77 lines focus on the primitive Diluvian family. They focus chiefly on the family of the eight survivors of the flood, together with the genealogy of Ham, that is the progeny of Ham, down into the second, third generations. But the, the main event of the opening 77 lines of the Marduk epic is is very different from the event that dominates the Marduk epic. The, that event is the tragedy of Genesis 9, Genesis 9.26, which mythologically becomes the death of Apsu. You might title it the poem of the death of Apsu. Apsu being one version of Noah, whose death represents the political eclipse of Noah as a result of a faction formed by the cursed patriarch Canaan and his son Sidon, Sidon. Those two, and especially Sidon, who is the Nudamud Enki figure, managed to do something to Noah's political power to avenge what Noah had done to Canaan in the cursed recorded in Genesis, recorded in Genesis 9.26. This is the main action, the main drift of it all, the main contact point, that uh, somehow the Hamite faction, the faction of Canaan and his son Sidon, alienated Noah, alienated Noah and Shem. And the result was the formation of a Cold War situation that has lasted to this very day. It, it eventually became the Jew-Gentile distinction. I call it the loyal, loyalist rebel distinction, where the Hamite faction, the faction of Canaan and Sidon, became the rebel cause and Noah represented a loyalist cause. Now, the Marduk epic is written from the classic Mesopotamian viewpoint, which is chiefly in line with the original rebel cause. After all, the Bible calls Mesopotamia the land of Nimrod, and Nimrod belonged to the rebel faction. My, my belief is about Nimrod is that he was a son of Canaan himself by a daughter of Cush. He's referred to as a son of Cush in Genesis 10, but I believe the relationship is actually more closely to, to Canaan. That doesn't mean the text is, is wrong, obviously. It means that the term son uh, is to be taken in a different sense, which it often is throughout Genesis 10, 11. But the, the, the idea being that the Canaanite faction wins a victory over Noah in the first 77 lines of the Marduk epic, and then thematically we skip forward to events that actually occurred much later, and that's Marduk's overthrow of Tiamat which I interpret as the Erica Rada War. Now, what kind of chronology are we looking at? The basic chronological unit of the early post diluvian world is a 30-year period. That's the unit. And the flood occurs, and Arpakshad I is born two years after the flood, and certain things happen 30 years after the flood, 60 years after the flood, and 90. Around the 90th year after the flood occurs the tragedy of Genesis 9. That is, the curse on Canaan and then this retaliation against the Canaanite faction against Noah. That occurs around the 90th year. The Erech Arata War, which can be approached from the Sumerian angle, and it doesn't look anything like the Marduk Epic, but it's the same event as the Marduk Epic. The Marduk Epic would be a mythological rendering of the same event described 
by Samuel Noah Kramer in his summation of the war of Lugobanda uh, against the Iranian city-state of Arata. It's the Arak, the war between this, the Mesopotamian city-state of, of Arak and the Iranian city-state of Arata. That is the substance, the historical substance, of the main action of the Marduk epic, which is Marduk's overthrow of Tiamat, the goddess of chaos, who is one of the early post-Diluvian uh, survivors of the flood. As a matter of fact, the red matriarch, Noah's royal wife, as I call her. Now, that event occurs 216 years after the flood. So it isn't just that you have a raw chronological interval of, what would that be, uh, 116 plus 10, uh, 126 years. Not only is there an interval of 126 years between the events of the first 77 lines of the Marduk epic and the events of the rest of the poem, but uh, you're overlooking uh, what would that be. 126 years is four Noahic generations, four 30-year periods, and you're overlooking all of the action that went on in that period. And what goes on in that period? Well, the first thing is that the sons of the family of Noah, that's still very small at the start of the era, 90 years after, migrates back from where the curse on Canaan occurred, which was in Yemen, in southern Arabia. They migrate back to Mesopotamia, and uh, the population of the world is built up sufficiently that they start a colonization process uh, for the next 30 years. But then that colonization process is ended with the Tower of Babel conspiracy by the Hamite Canaanite faction. And that takes up a 30-year period. At the end of that 30-year period that's interrupted by the divine judgment recorded in the uh, text of Genesis 11, that is the judgment of the Tower of Babel, the next 30-year period, which I identify with the first Kish section of the Sumerian king list, is the period running from 180 to 210. And that era is the one dominated by Peleg, who becomes the ruler of the entire early post diluvian community in Mesopotamia for a 30-year period from the 180th to the 210th years after the flood. This is eras, this is, this is Peleg's era, and you're forced into a pun because the the Sumerian name for Peleg is Nergal, and the Akkadian or Semitic name for Peleg is Era, E-R-R-A, like a pun on our word, Greek-based word, Era, E-R-A, -E so it was Greek or Latin. The Greek word is epoch. But be that as it may, the Peleg dominates the world from the 180th to the 210th years after the flood, and this is reflected in the text of the first Kish section the first Kish dynasty section of the Eastern king list, the king list of the Sumerians. Now, the main action of this new poem of Era brought to my attention, which really means the poem of Peleg, and Peleg is a grandson of Sheila, who is Marduk. So Era is actually a grandson of, of Marduk. It may not be presented that way in the text at all, but that's the actual genetic relationship of the human beings to whom these god names refer the god named Marduk is a theological, theocratic, mythological rendering of the patriarch Shela of the imperial line of Genesis 11. And his grandson, through Eber, Peleg, is the human original behind the deity Era, and the poem of Era is about the interaction between Era and Marduk, that is, between Peleg and his grandfather Shela. And the main action of the poem, and it, it, like most of these poems, it really doesn't amount to much when you sift it all out, is that Era rises to a position of great authority and governs the world in lieu of the senile Marduk. Well, now what does that mean? Well, there was only one 30-year era when, when Peleg dominated the world. That was the first Kish era. So the main action, the main subject matter, if you demythologize the text or just interpret the mythology that's there, the main action of the poem is simply the existence of the first Kish era. See, these different eras, the different 30-year eras, are the substance of the historical record of early post-Diluvian man, which is the earliest Gentile version of man. And if you're going to have any contact whatsoever with what really happened after the flood in these various traditions, and of course, they're mythological, they're propagandistic, they, there's a motive to suppress the Noahic heritage, but there's also a motive to remember it. So there's, there are mixed motives in all of this. But if you're going to have any contact whatsoever with early post-Diluvian history, you've got to have a rendering of these various 30-year intervals. And the Gundus group Cauldron does that one way. And if you put the Marduk epic together with the poem of Era, 
you get about three or four of the eras. That isn't the complete picture. You don't have a complete panorama, but you get, you get a good deal of it. Uh, the early part, again, of the Epic of Marduk gives you events around 90 years after the flood, at the end of the 30-year uh, era after the flood. The poem of Era, by focusing on the rise of Era and Isham to supplant Marduk for a while, simply renders that, I don't know the number, it's from the 180th, that would be from the, let's see, you've got 90 would be the third era, the 120 to 120 would be the fourth, 150 is the, uh, is the fifth, and therefore from 150 to 180 would be the sixth, and this apparently would be the seventh. In any case, it's from 180, from the 180th year after the flood to the 210th year after the flood is the period dominated by Peleg, and that's simply the subject matter of the poem of Era. Now that really doesn't contribute much, except that it, it again is corroborative in a number of different ways. It shows that the Mesopotamians were privy to a lot more than appears in the text. It means that there's a coordination behind it all. It means that the uh, Mesopotamians were privy to the 30-year analytic sacred history of the earliest Gentile man. In other words, they knew that they had to have a rendering of each one of these 30-year periods. And theoretically, if you keep looking at, uh, at the mythology of Mesopotamia, and if we can assume that providentially all of it has, enough of it has survived to be representative of a canon, you're going to find a canon of major themes, each associated with these 30-year intervals, 30-year eras, because these are the subject matter of early post diluvian history. So the Marduk epic carries you back to one of them in the first part, and it carries you breaks. The poem of Era sketches in still another segment. But in the process of simply sketching in this idea that Peleg came to power, if you sift, sift it out, that's all it means. Peleg came to power from the 180th year to the 210th, and that's what you're getting. But if you sift this all out, uh, you, you begin to discover some things. Aside from the fact it teaches you that the Mesopotamians could not allow themselves to forget any one of these 30-year er, inter intervals. They could leave them out of a given work, like the Marduk epic, but they knew someone was coordinating this. Someone was coordinating these traditions so that they knew they would have to produce a different work to represent the, another era. And if you keep looking at the Mesopotamian tradition, you probably find all of the 30-year er intervals. Just as I, I would think for a while, the, uh, the struggle between Zu and, uh, and Ninurta clearly puts Nimrod on the map. The struggle between the Zu bird and Nimrod. That fills in another one of the 30-year intervals. That's the main subject matter from the 150th to the 180th year of the Tower of Babel interval, because it's in that interval that the zoo bird is Shem and Anurta is Nimrod. It's the struggle between Shem and Nimrod over the capital zone of Akkad. That's what's going on, and over the control of the Semitic linguistic stock. And it's in that era, the Tower of Babel era, through the action of Nimrod against Shem, that the land of Mesopotamia takes on its identity as the land of Nimrod rather than the land of Shem, because the Bible refers to Mesopotamia as the land of Nimrod. Now that particular struggle, recorded in that particular myth, which is a Sumerian myth, I don't know whether it was a Akkadian counterpart to it, but it's the struggle between Zu and, and Nergal, not Zu and Nergal, Zu and Ninurta, that's the struggle between Shem and Nimrod in the Tower of Babel era. That's the 150th year to the 180th year, while the poem of Era is bringing in the 180th year to the 210th. And the climactic part of the Marduk epic is telling you what happens after the 210th. In, in addition to just corroborating the basic belief I have that the whoever is creating the Marduk epic, uh, that there's, a, there's a coordinated tradition, and it's based on a memory of each of these 30-year eras, and various poems are written on these as the main, main mythological focus. Aside from corroborating that, you learn something from the poem of Era, and that, is, that has to do with the senility of Marduk, the idea that Marduk is on the wane, he's on the way out at the rise of Era and Isham, and that's one of the factors in the poem. Now what do you learn from that? Well, in the first place, a Marduk refers to Sheila, who happens to be Peleg's grandfather. And you might say, well, he's just genetically fading away at the time that Peleg is coming on. But it doesn't work that way because 
the glory of Marduk is his action as the hero Lugobanda in the in the uh, Erika Rada War era that follows that follows the main action of the poem of Era. So what does it mean that Marduk is a senile old man or losing his power, uh, so to speak? What does it mean? Well, what it tells you, what it teaches you, is this is a very important point. This is something that I perhaps would not have realized before, although the one might well have guessed it, one might well have supposed it. If you're going to identify Sheila Marduk with the whole cause of the Mesopotamian order, you might consider that Sheila Marduk was a prime mover in the Tower of Babel episode, as was Canaan, as was Sidon, as was Nimrod, the other members of that family. Why? Well, if, if Marduk is pictured as a, as a senile old man or is losing his power, conventional mythological interpretation would probably say, well, these events must be occurring after Marduk's victory over Tiamat. I don't know that the text would support that, but if it does, the text is mendacious, it's lying. Because the events occurring here occurred before the victory of Marduk over Tiamat. For the reason stated, the victory of, of Marduk over Tiamat is the Erika Rada War of the 216th year, and the rise of Peleg as Aaron Ergol is in the period of uh, from the 180th to the 210th, the previous era. So what you're learning from, from the fact that Marduk is pictured as old and senile and over the hill is that the Mesopotamians knew that Marduk had, raised, had, had been raised to a peak of power and importance in the previous era, for the 150th year to the 180th, and that's the Tower of Babel era. Now, the Marduk epic, as far as I can see, does not, does not glorify Sheila Marduk in the context of the Tower of Babel era because it doesn't contain it. It doesn't have any reference to it. So uh, you're approaching the Tower of Babel uh, era only indirectly in the Epic of Marduk. You're mainly just skipping over it. And the only vestige of the Tower of Babel era that you have uh, in this high mythology from Mesopotamia, these texts, is in the, in the fact that Sheila is over the hill. Marduk is over the hill at the rise of Aaron and uh, Nergal Peleg. You see, Peleg is coming on. Peleg only came on once in that sense. Peleg came to dominate the world only once. It was from the 180th year to the 210th. And the Gauls, the, the Gales, remembered that so well that they memorialized it as in the figure of the horned one, Carnunus, sit, uh, sitting in the middle of all these creatures. That is the first Kish order. That is the regime of Era and Isham. And we'll identify Isham a little later. But the mere fact that Marduk is pictured as senile or over the hill or having lost his power or lost his sense of whatever is an attestation to the shift of political power that occurred at the 180th year and it equates Marduk personally with the entire regime of the Tower of Babel era. In other words, it incriminates Marduk in my eyes in the same way that I always believed that, Sh that Sheila Marduk, the figure Sheila, the imperial figure on the main Semite line between Arphaxad and Eber, was a ringleader of the original rebel faction. And why was that? What, what made Marduk, Sheila, such a, uh, a key figure in the anti-Noah rebellion, the original anti-Noah rebellion? It's very simple. Sheila Marduk, Marduk is a son of Mudamun, Enki, Ea, Sidon, son of Canaan. Even though Sheila's name appears in the Semite line, the imperial Semite line of Genesis 11, the actual genetics of the, of the situation is that Sheila Marduk is a son of Sidon by a daughter of Arpakshad One. See, Shem begets Arpakshad One, or Arphoxid One, however you want to pronounce it. You've got different sources. Arphoxid One is born two years after the flood. He begets uh, a daughter. Uh, call her Diti, call her Anana, a lot of different names can be given to this daughter, a very important figure, call her Esther. She marries Sidon, son of Canaan, and the two of them give birth to this Sheila Marduk figure, who therefore blends the line of Shem from the feminine side with the line of the cursed patriarch Canaan from the masculine side, but for some reason, through some compromise, this figure that is from the line of Ham and Canaan and Sidon, on the male side, is carried over and recorded in sacred scripture, holy writ, in Shem's line, because Shem gets the glory for forming the imperial messianic line of Genesis 11, but in terms of fact, that line comes through the male line of Ham, rather than the male line of Shem, through this female figure. 
Now, the first child then, the, the immediate child of the imperial line, the imperial line goes then from Arpaxid's daughter and Sidon to the figure Shelah. And then from that time on, it's just a straight genealogy. She, uh, it's, it's male from that point on. Shelah begets Eber, and Eber begets Peleg, and Peleg begets Ru, and so forth. It's the imperial line because Ru, son of Peleg, is Sargon, the founder of the Akkadian Empire. It's a, it's a mess, messianic imperial line. Now, be, however, because Shelah is in the first generation of Sidon, who's the great mastermind, Enki Nudamud Ea, the great mastermind of world paganism in the rebel cause of his father Canaan, who was cursed by Noah, and therefore this is, I call it rebel, I simply mean anti-Noahic. Shelah was this, the first, uh, was a, he was an immediate son of Sidon. And his identification, despite the fact that the Mesopotamians are trying to give him his messianic identity, that is his loyalist identity vis-a-vis -vis Shem, he is still personally loyal to his physical father, Sidon, son of Canaan. And the result is that the Tower of Babel era that was clearly dominated by the factions, see these were like, these were like a two-party system. These two factions dominated the world in sequence. So the reason that Peleg comes to power between the 180th and 210th years, it was, it was the turn of the royal faction, the royalist faction, to dominate the world. Before that, it was the turn of the rebel faction to dominate the world, and they built the Tower of Babel between the 150th year and the 100, between the 150th and the 180th. Before that, before the 120th, between the 120th and the 150th, the world had been dominated by the Hirschnatter figure, by the figure of Shem, with the two factions, the, the, two, uh, the two linguistic stocks, embryonic linguistic stocks that he was forming under his own name, the original Semitic stock that had originally come from Ham, and his own stock, the Indo-European. And so Shem is a kind of incarnation of the, of the Bible with the Semitic Old Testament and Indo-European New Testament, Greek New Testament, he's dominating those two embryonic stocks in Mesopotamia between the 120th and 150th years, and he's doing so as a loyalist, as a son of Noah, in the Noah faction. He's the Mumu figure, who allies with the Apsu figure in the uh, Marduk epic. So you swing back and forth. The loyalist era, 120-150 the rebel era, 150-180, and then another loyalist era under Peleg, who's a loyalist for a variety of reasons, but he's a very complex loyalist because he became a, a counter-revolutionary rebel and uh, became alienated from parts of the loyalist faction. And so that's the reason why Era, Nergal, has this ambivalent uh, image in this Mesopotamian record. They make him both malevolent and also benevolent. His malevolent aspect is in keeping with his classic identity as a loyalist, an anti-Mesopotamian, anti-Nimrod, anti-Canaanite figure. That makes him malevolent toward he's the enemy of Babylon. In fact, that's how I first encountered the name Nergal, enemy of Babylon. Well, he's an enemy of Babylon because he's the enemy of the Tower of Babel faction. He's a loyalist. He's allied with Noah against uh, uh, the family of, of Canaan and against his grandfather, Shelah Marduk. But the point is that the, the poem of Era pictures Marduk as fading away politically, and he's fading away because that's exactly what the Tower of Babel faction, the rebel faction, did in the 180th year. And Peleg comes on. So there you have an attestation of a shift. But what I've learned from it is the extent to which Marduk was acknowledged and understood to be a representative of the rebel anti-Noah faction that built the Tower of Babel. And therefore, the former glory of Marduk in the poem of Era is the Tower of Babel era from the 150th year to the 180th year. The period of the rise of, of, uh, of, of Era, Nergal, is the, what I always thought it was, is the era of Kernunus the Horned One. It's the period from the 180th year to the 210th, the first Kish order. And then his ally, his herald, Isham, that confirms something that I knew by intuition a long time ago. I don't know how clearly it's stated in the Genesis 10 book. I knew a long time ago that there was some sort of an alliance between Peleg, son of Eber, son of Shelah, and therefore a great-great-grandson of, of Sidon, son of Canaan. I knew there was an alliance with Canaan's own son, who is called Heth, Kate, in Genesis, uh, Genesis 10, the, uh, the explicit ancestor of the Hittites. One hint of an association between Peleg and Heth, father of the... Uh, of the uh, of, of the Hittites. One hint is that the Hittites spoke an exotic form of Indo-European. 
which in some, to some extent is a sign of the loyalist faction, as though Heth was a son of Canaan who went over to the loyalist side. See, these families are being torn apart by this political con conflict. But why associate Heth with Peleg? What, what, what gave me that association? Well, part of it's ethnographic. Peleg is to the Phrygians of Western Anatolia, who settle in Western Anatolia, the Trojans, in other words, who are the Phrygians. Peleg, that's a, that's a version of his tribe. There's a cognate relationship from Peleg, Phrixus, and, and uh, the Phrygians. Uh, what Peleg's Phrygians are to Anatolia, or to Asia Minor, in other words, and the western part of it, what the Hittites were to Central Asia Minor, or Eastern Asia Minor, and eventually Western Asia Minor as well. So in other words, Heth and Peleg inherit the earth in what is now Turkey. They are two dominant, the Phrygians and the Hittites. Now, they no doubt uh, dominate the, the, uh, that part of the world in two different ages or two different periods, but the fact is that they, there, are, there are land claims there, and they go back to an old alliance between Prince Peleg and Prince Heth. And therefore, they're allied. And the poem of Arab brings that out explicitly because it's very clear that Isham is Heth. He's identified in the text, the Semitic text, as Isham. And then the commentary on it uh, says that he answers to, uh, I'm trying to recall the, the name of the, of the Sumerian name, something Dursanga, Herdusanga, no, something, some, something, some name. I have to look up the text again to see what the Sumerian name of Isham is. But he's the herald of Era. And therefore, he's a version of Heth, and it just it, it fulfills what I felt a long time ago. The other reason, the other cogent reason, is that um, uh, Mesopotamian propaganda being what is Canaan, so that Poseidon is Sidon, Sidon, and Heth is Hades, the god of the underworld. So when you're told that Isham is a god of the underworld and a god of fire, and you already knew that Aranergal had that quality, you know that both Peleg and also Heth are uh, allied or connected mythologically, and then in comes the poem of Era that simply confirms that, that makes Isham, Heth, the herald of, uh, of Era, and the two of them together build the first Kish order. And as a matter of fact, I believe that somewhere in the Genesis 10 text, in my book, or, or somewhere at least in my reasoning on the, on the names that enter into it, that I've actually identified Heth in the context of the first Kish order, but I have to look at that again. Anyway, Peleg and Heth are the creators of a political regime that dominated the world from the 180th year to the 210th year after the flood and picked up the pieces after the fall of the Tower of Babel enterprise that had occurred in the previous era. And the text identifies that previous era implicitly with, well, not implicitly, it, it identifies it with Marduk because Marduk is fading out. He's not coming on. Now, the actual fact was that Marduk came on in the next era and won the great war that gives him the identity of overthrowing Tiamat in the next era, after the 210th year. But it, the reason why he's pictured as senile and fading away at the 180th year with the rise of Peleg is, again, that the mythologists knew, they knew that Sheila was a member of that rebel faction that built the Tower of Babel. And they won't confess the Tower of Babel. That they won't confess. But what, what they will confess is that Sheila Marduk was on top of the political era that existed at that time, and therefore that Sheila Marduk is fading away in the 180th year as this other figure comes on. Another thing that I learned, and again it has to do with the nature of the propaganda, it doesn't add to my knowledge of what happened. It adds to my knowledge of how what happened was conceived, and that is the figure of the Sibiti. The Sibiti, as described, are... Uh, beings that are created by Anum and the earth. And instead of being strictly genealogical, it's very clear that the, the Sabiti are a sect of seven beings, creatures, who are totally evil, that is malevolent, which is to say anti-Mesopotamian. That's how you have to read the propaganda from Mesopotamia. And Anum, uh, who is, I think, a version of Anu, the father of the gods, the original Anu, now this is not the Ar Anu of the Marduk epic, because his identity has shifted around because of the rebellion against Noah, but the original An, the original priest of El Elyon, who's the heaven principle, the original Anu heaven figure, the creator of the Uralo Altaic linguistic stock, who are the people of the heaven principle, is the original Uralo Altaic, and that's the patriarch Noah. So when you look at the interaction between Anum and the Sibiti, the sevenfold malevolent Sibiti, who uh, uh, bring in a reign of terror as a result of the will of Anum, this is clearly simply a personification of the seven survivors of the flood at a point beyond